British Airways has a history that dates back over a hundred years. It called itself the world's favourite airline, and we all loved that. It soared through monumental changes in air travel. Boat planes were extraordinary. I mean, they were almost absurd. And been a trailblazer for new types of aircraft. I think once you'd flown on Concorde, it was like being a member of an exclusive club. But their century in the skies hasn't been without its challenges. From bad press and public spats to fierce competition from other airlines. I don't care what fare you've got, mine is the cheapest. Through mergers and acquisitions, our national carrier has continued to be a major player on the world stage. This is the story of British Airways, then and now. Each year, British Airways flies its 45 million customers to more than 200 destinations around the world. And at its home base of Heathrow Terminal 5, 600 flights depart and arrive every day. But the BA of today is a long way from the airline's more humble beginnings over 100 years ago. On the 25th of August, Aircraft Transport and Travel Limited began a regular daily service between London and Paris. British Airways can trace its origins back to the world's first ever commercial scheduled passenger flight, which departed from a military airfield at Hounslow Heath, bound for Le Bourget in Paris on the 25th of August 1919. It was a very, very important occasion, the start of something brand new and a new era for the whole of aviation, really. This is the place where flying really started, not at Heathrow, but here uh, on Hounslow Heath. It was just an old cavalry ground. The army had been based here for centuries, but it was flat, it was near London, it was ideal. Two miles southeast of today's Heathrow, Hounslow Heath was London's only commercial airport at the time. And that first air service was run by BA's predecessor, a small private company named Aircraft Transport and Travel, using an ex-World War I plane. It was a DH-4, it was a fabric and wood aeroplane, had an open cockpit, single engine, and uh, they'd actually been designed in the First World War for bomb drops, so they weren't really a passenger aircraft. It was a strange choice, really, for the first flight of a, an international airline. But it was to be this first flight that would go down in history. We're very fortunate in having a full account from the pilot about the journey. Um, he said, it was a grim morning with heavy rain and practically no visibility. Conditions were sticky over the outskirts of London and with the compass swinging constantly through 45 degrees, Lawford, the pilot, hedgehopped all the way to the coast. Over the channel, he flew at no feet, narrowly missing a light ship. On landing at Le Bourget, the gendarmerie approached, kissed the pilot and said, Alors, mon vieux, bien fait? Votre passeport, s'il vous plaît. The flight had taken two hours and 15 minutes. Today, the flight time to Paris is just over an hour on modern, efficient aircraft. And unlike those early passenger flights, customers' comfort and safety is now of paramount importance to British Airways. Now, each one of the airline's 16,500 cabin crew receive training at their state-of-the-art Global Learning Academy. Welcome to the Global Learning Academy, and we're in the safety hall, as you can see full of equipment, and this is where we do the majority of our practical training. So you're trying to get that bit in and up? Still We're safe. training our cabin crew here on vital skills that will save lives on board. This is the captain, this is an emergency. Brace, brace! Brace, brace! Under the watchful eye of our trainers, we make sure that not only do we teach them the theory, but then we give them lots of opportunity to practice and practice and practice and they won't leave here until we're confident that they understand how to operate all of the equipment that we have on board. Press the orange shock button now. Shocking now. Shock delivered. Some of this equipment is very recognisable. This is a slide raft. So this is the famous, can you take your shoes off please? Don't take your hand baggage and come down the slides. So we teach our cabin crew how to safely not only come down the slides themselves, but to get um, our passengers down the slides while other, more high-tech offerings are recent additions to the safety hall. 
The R-Craft is a new piece of equipment that we've built. It allows us to simulate um, what it's like to be inside an aircraft, because obviously we can't always take our new entrants to practice on aircrafts as maybe we would like to. So what we do is we build replica aircraft, which allow us to to get the crew to experience every element, not only of service, but also of um, managing our safety routines. The wonderful thing about the iCraft is it allows our crew to control that from an iPad. They can make the plane turbulent, they can set the doors to automatic, they can drop um, oxygen masks. This is the captain, this is an emergency brace, brace. Oh, brace, 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 brace. We make sure that whenever we launch a new seat, or we launch a new aircraft, any of the equipment or any of the facilities that come with that new product are brought into the Global Learning Academy so that we can train our crew before they get to deal with our customers. Safety on board the earliest passenger planes was, in contrast, lacking. Even a seatbelt, one of the most basic of measures, was missing. And for the small airlines that emerged during this period, passenger welfare became a priority. So too did the need to create a more comfortable in-flight experience. A passenger aircraft was basically the same as a World War II bomber or as a transport aircraft in that they were driven by piston engines and the piston engines would drive a propeller. So basically you were flying in an old-fashioned piston-engined aircraft which was trying to shake itself to pieces. Inside, it would have been very uncomfortable. I mean, for the passengers in those first few years, uh, the chairs would have been wickerwork chairs, no safety belts. Um, and of course, the key difference, the key thing about those early flights was that you had to fly below the clouds, below the weather, because you had to navigate looking at the ground. So that would have made it very exciting, but also very uncomfortable, very bumpy. Uh, under the passenger seats, there would have been a pot for when you threw up because it was so bumpy. And if you needed to use the loo, it was a curtain with a, with a, pot, a bucket behind it. So you can imagine if you were doing that and the plane hit really bad weather, the bucket and you might go toppling over. By 1922, the standard fare for a round trip to Paris was 12 pounds, equivalent to 687 pounds today. But these small airlines were failing to make enough money, and change was afoot. By 1924, the position had become so serious that the government appointed a committee, later known as the Hambling Committee, to report on the methods of putting British air transport on a sound footing. The British government had recognised the importance of civil aviation, especially with regards to developing air links with its overseas empire and decided to merge these smaller companies to create Imperial Airways in 1924. It was so important to the British because of the British Empire that they needed fast communication routes in order to be able to manage such a huge empire and to keep control. Imperial Airways really was a national airline. The government was obsessed with the idea, and obsessed isn't too strong a word, that this new form of transport could link the empire together. Coming up, Imperial's empire routes see the launch of a new type of aircraft. Because you couldn't go to some remote place in Africa and build a runway, you just couldn't do it. So boat planes were the answer. And the latest member of BA's airport staff rolls into Heathrow's Terminal 5. Good morning, welcome to British Airways. Where can I take you? British Airways is the largest international carrier in the UK. It now travels to 80 countries around the world with 800 flights a day, which are controlled here in the Global Ops Room. Global Ops is overall in control of delivering yeah, the operation 24-7, um, and it's the on-the-day operation, um, and pulling together all the key pieces, so the aircraft crewing, um, to make sure that we uh, operate uh, all of our scheduled services and delivering them for our customers throughout the day. Uh, flight planning are over here. This is our team that uh, will plan all the routes for our services. Um, so it's uh, uh, fuel um, and how much fuel they need to make that trip. They work very closely with our load control department uh, who will plan the weight of the aircraft to make sure the aircraft's balanced uh, to take off safely. Back in the 1950s, BOAC's monitoring of their fleet of around 50 planes was a little more basic. They are in movements control, the world is at their fingertips. They turn messages picked out of the air by radio or sent along transcontinental cables 
into a running record of every speedbird on the global air routes. Now, Global Ops use a highly sophisticated computerized system to monitor BA's flights. This is a movement manager, which is our aircraft tracking system. So our ops controllers use that. Um, and it will show you where every aircraft is and what sectors it's doing for the day, um, its time of departure, uh, time of arrival, uh, which aircraft it's turning around to, and it'll also give us details of flight crew. But as the nerve centre of the whole British Airways operation, the smooth running of the airline rests on the team's shoulders. Our customers expect us to be punctual, um, but we also plan all of our resources and our entire flying programme is built around us operating on time. Um, so for us to be able to, to keep to those schedules, we've got to deliver a punctual operation. So a minute at the start of the day could turn into 25, 30 minutes by the end of the day. And we're constantly changing, changing the plan uh, throughout the day. But back at the birth of Imperial Airways in 1924, they faced an entirely different problem. Confronted with the huge task of creating a new route network throughout the empire, they'd inherited a fleet of single-engine aircraft completely unsuited to the job. The answer was a bold new design, the HP-42. So they specified it must have four engines. By 1928, that was a stipulation for, by Imperial Airways, and that was to make air travel safer, because if you had an engine failure, you still had another three engines that are running that's going to get you to your destination. So that improved safety and reliability. These were the first four-engined airliners in the world. They wanted Hadley Page to design a specific type of airliner. They wanted something much bigger than they already had. What they came up with this was this truly humongous airliner at the time. There was nothing else like it. It was the biggest airliner production. It was actually the biggest ever biplane airliner. It had a huge 130-foot wingspan. The first time it had an enclosed cockpit for the pilots. Up until then, all the cockpits of airliners were, were open to the elements. So in the winter, you know, pilots are getting snowed on, raid on, and they still want to try and fly an aircraft and navigate at the same time. With up to 38 seats, it was the airline's biggest plane, and inside it was the height of luxury. Imperial Airways is very clear that the cabin should be a very high standard to attract their premium passengers. So it really was what we really consider as an airliner. We can actually see those components that we have in an airliner today. So a proper cabin designed for passengers and their comfort, uh, support services with galleys and a steward to actually serve the passengers, as well new technology uh, with the engines. It wasn't particularly fast, it cruised at 95 miles an hour. But for Imperial Airways, it was extraordinarily successful. It was actually the airliner they used to establish all the long-range routes, so going down through Africa, through the Middle East and Far East, and eventually to connect up with the Australian services. So it was a very capable airliner. But whilst today a flight to Cape Town from Heathrow takes just under 11 hours, these early journeys throughout the empire were very different. They couldn't fly as far as nowadays, so they went in stages. So it was been really, really exciting and romantic to fly to Paris, to Rome, Brindisi, Alexandria, uh, Khartoum, uh, all the way perhaps to India and then to Cape Town in South Africa as well. Because it wasn't very high, you could sightsee through the windows and you could stop at all the different places on the way. The first Imperial Airways flight to Johannesburg in 1932 took 11 days, with 28 stops en route. But back then, the focus wasn't so much on transporting passengers to these far-flung destinations as it was another cargo. All letters and postcards dispatched from the United Kingdom for delivery along the Empire routes would be carried by air without surcharge. Furthermore, the government said that Imperial Airways was to be its chosen instrument for the execution of this program. They carried mail within the empire for the, for the same price as, as um, ordinary mail. I was no air mail surcharge. And that empire air mail scheme launched officially in 1937. Mail was vital, and again, because of this uh, empire building, some people have said mail was more important than uh, the passengers because many, much of the mail, were, it was important documents that were being flown from Britain and they needed to get them there quickly because it would change the way you know, places were run. Carrying the mail obviously became more important uh, than carrying live customers. And I often think probably the mail complained less than the customers did. But... British Airways still carries 15,000 tonnes of air mail each year and are proud to have the Royal Mail logo on the side of every aircraft. 
But now, customers are very much a priority, and up to 145,000 people fly with them every day, with 90,000 passing through their home base at Heathrow's Terminal 5, where in 2020, customer service took an entirely new twist. Good morning, welcome to British Airways. Where can I take you? These fully autonomous robots, named Bill, after the captain who made that first ever scheduled flight to Paris by BA's predecessor AT&T, are being trialled to carry out simple tasks in the hope that the airport's real-life hosts can be left to focus on more complex customer queries. Here's the cafe. Do you want me to take you now? The cutting-edge robots are programmed to interact with passengers in different languages to answer thousands of questions, including real-time flight information. And if they prove a success and become a permanent fixture, they should enable travellers to enjoy a faster and smoother journey through the airport and beyond. But back at the dawn of civil aviation, airport facilities were somewhat more primitive. In the spring of 1920, Croydon Airport was opened for the operation of cross-channel air services. The former World War I military airfield at Croydon took over from Hounslow Heath as the site for Britain's international air travel. It was quite a big airfield uh, than the temporary airfield at Hounslow Heath. It was better located, so it was actually nearer the destination, so half an hour nearer. It meant the aircraft didn't have to fly over London. They slowly expanded that to put in facilities to handle cargo, uh, customs facilities. Imperial Airways ran their operations from Croydon, and as passenger numbers increased, the airport needed to move with the times. One of the things that we're finding with the, the airport at the time um, is that it wasn't really designed for passenger airliners. So it's still relatively small. Uh, the surrounding area wasn't very clear for aircraft to take up land. They needed to actually expand the airport and they started building it in 1926 and they completed it in 1928. In May, Lady Maud Hoare, the wife of the Secretary of State for Air, opened the rebuilt airport at Croydon. Passenger numbers at Croydon had dramatically increased from 2,000 in 1920 to 27,000 in 1928 when the new airport opened. It was the world's biggest airport at the time. It was a very modern design. It used steel frame, which is easy to extend if they needed to in the future. It was built with 50,000 concrete blocks. It was hugely important. It was the first airport to have a control tower. Croydon, Croydon, Imperial RN calling, Imperial RN calling. Give me my position, please. Give me my position, please. Over. It was the place where the infrastructure started to be built. So what we've got is something that we'd recognise in airports. It's the first time there's been a specifically built check-in area. As you come in, you go to your prospective uh, airline desk to check in and get your ticket, and you then go through the processes that you need to to get onto the airlines. You'll then go through security, immigration and customs, then you'll go out the one departure gate they had here to get onto the airline, and that would all be done in about 10 minutes. But during Imperial Airways' expansion of their empire routes in the 1930s, airport runways were frequently replaced by waterways, thanks to the launch of a very different kind of aircraft. Because you couldn't go to some remote place in Africa and build a runway, you just couldn't do it. So boat planes were the answer, because there were so many lakes down through Africa, it was easy. You just did the same leapfrogging thing, landing every night on, on lakes and then you didn't need the infrastructure. So when they left Britain, they took off from Southampton on the sea and then were able to land at, uh, on the sea or on large lakes, uh, stops along the way. These flights teach the men how to select a suitable stretch of water on which to alight in the event of a forced landing, a situation which might arise when they are flying on the Empire route. But it wasn't always plain sailing for the new flying boats. It needed about a mile of water to take off, so it had to be quite a big lake. The idea was that, you know, it meant that you didn't have to build airfields. But of course, that, <laughs> that also left you with a problem that you've got to find a bit of water to land on. The introduction of these new flying boats also meant it was back to school for their crews. Not only did they have to know how to fly, but they also had to find their sea legs. After this, they go on to larger three-engine machines. First, the men take a course in seamanship. They're taught how to make knots and splices. Then they learn how to handle a sailing boat. So the flying boat pupils keep on taking off, landing and taxiing until they can do so perfectly. But for passengers, at least, these flying boats would offer a spectacular experience. You see, it's my birthday. I'm captain when it's going to show me around the flying boat for a treat. 
Okay, Sonny, I'll check out. Ultimate in luxury, and the crews who flew the seaplanes, uh, the boats as they call them, uh, were very, very proud of that. Ever been up before, Michael? No. Am I coming? Oh, Captain Wynn, am I really coming with you? Definitely. After all, it's your birthday. Oh, I see that. Wonderful. And uh, from the passenger experience, it was probably the most unique uh, sort of flying that there has been, because they would fly during the day, and they would land somewhere suitable, and they would all, together with the crew, go and stay in an extremely nice hotel for the night, and then they would set off again in the daylight the next day. It took a long time to get anywhere, but it was a very superior experience indeed. Speedbird calling Southampton Pinners. May we take off? May we take off? The boat planes were, even by the standards of travelling first class today, boat planes were extraordinary. I mean, they were almost absurd. There were two decks. Uh, one deck you, you had to take, um, they took the mail, and the other deck, the, the passengers. And there was a library on, on these boats, <laughs> a library, fully stocked. Um, you, could, you could sleep in a bed. There was built at the side, a bit like a, going up in a, in a balloon with a basket. There were, you could open a door, while the plane was flying, step out onto a prom deck and sort of wave to the antelope as, <laughs> as you flew over. By 1950, the reign of the flying boat was over, thanks to the rapid development of airfields across the world, and they were about to be replaced with a new dawn in aviation. The jet age had arrived. Coming up, the comet revolutionises air travel. It was nothing like passengers had ever seen before. And pilot training, then and now. The simulators before that, literally just a, a box on legs to start with. And then all the way to these modern sims that are multi-million pound pieces of device. British Airways has a history that dates back over a hundred years. But the first time the name actually graced an airline was in 1936, when a new private company, British Airways Limited, was established. One of their most famous passengers being Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, when he flew to Munich for a series of meetings with Adolf Hitler. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. But the airline didn't last long. In 1939, as World War II loomed, the government decided it would be of national interest to purchase British Airways Limited and merge it with Imperial Airways. It was obvious there was going to be a war. There was the certain knowledge that all passenger flying would stop. And the government wanted um, to make sure that the resources of the aircraft industry could be used for war. They decided they would form it under the chairmanship of Sir John Reith, who had already set up, of course, the BBC. It was he who decided that it should be called the British Overseas Airways Corporation. The company, most commonly known as BOAC, started to operate as a commercial airline at the end of the war. And in the early 1950s, one of the biggest advances in aviation history was to place them at the top of their game. The comet has arrived, and with her, a new age of travel. On the 2nd of May, 1952, BOAC operated the world's first pure jet scheduled passenger air service from London to Johannesburg, flying a British-built de Havilland Comet 1. De Havilland realised during the war that if they were to retain any sort of an edge in passenger transport after the war, they couldn't carry on with pistoned engine aircraft. They had to go for the jet engine instead. And so they put a lot of effort into designing and developing the world's first jet passenger aircraft. A jet engine, it works on a completely different principle to a piston engine. You're not burning fuel inside a cylinder anymore. You're sucking air in from the air intake. You're compressing it and then you're burning the fuel continuously in a combustion chamber and as it rushes out the back as very, very hot gas, it rushes out at a much faster velocity than it goes in and so that velocity coming out generates the thrust which pushes the whole engine forward. With this, the Comet completely revolutionised air travel. 
It was the Concorde of its day, really. Prior to that, piston-engined aircraft were slow, they were noisy, they vibrated. The Comet, when it came along, flew fast, it flew high, it could fly over the weather, it was smooth inside. No, this is not a new gambling game. It's just a way of proving the remarkable absence of vibration during flight. This factor and the lack of engine noise in the cabin constitute a real advance in air transport luxury. When VOAC inaugurated the first Comet jet flights, it was nothing like passengers had ever seen before. They were at their destination half the time and in much greater comfort too. Now you're climbing swiftly, steeply, with the jets at full power. But there's none of that blocked up sensation in your ears. The pressure system in her cabin keeps you comfortable, all the way up to 40,000 feet and down again. After the initial success of the Comet 1, two crashes caused the entire fleet to be grounded. Structural failure was found to be the cause, leading to a complete redesign of the aircraft. The Comet emerged as a very much improved and very competitive and very, very successful airliner. Um, comets flew all the way around the world until the 1990s. Although groundbreaking at the time, the Comet is still a world away from the newest members of BA's fleet the Airbus A350 and the Boeing 787, which have both been built for comfort, distance and efficiency. If you stepped on board a, a Comet, it was very much, you know, it had the feel and the look of, a, of an old military aircraft. Our new aircraft are, are incredible. Just look at the wing on the 350. I mean, it's beautiful. It's literally, it was, it was shaped off looking at birds and, and, it, and it changes in the air to get the most efficient wing, which is, it, it's incredible. So it reduces fuel burn, it reduces CO2 emissions. And also with new engines, they're very, very efficient and they're very quiet as well. If you see a modern aircraft take off, um, it's really, really quiet. Both of these planes are lighter thanks to the introduction of carbon fiber to their structure, meaning they are able to travel further and help reduce the airline's two billion pound annual fuel bill. It also has benefits for passengers too. You can put really large windows in, um, which is fantastic for our customers. And, and you don't need window blinds, you know, you can use electronics to mist out them. And the, the lighting in the cabins now, there's science around what the lighting's like so that you get a better night's sleep. And the, the cabin air as well is, it goes through filters and it's, and it's cycled, so it's, it's fantastic with humidities better. And it's all focused on making the customer experience something fantastic. Um, and that's what these, these modern aircraft give us. The first plane to truly transform customer experience and aviation as a whole was the Boeing 747, introduced in 1971. The first jumbo jet opened up air travel to the masses and led to the major rearrangement of the stands at Heathrow's Terminal 3, along with the check-in facilities to handle the larger volumes of passengers. By the time BOAC and British European Airways merged to form British Airways in 1974, there were 15 747s in the newly formed airline's fleet. Well, the, the 747 has been a, a revolutionary aircraft. It's hard to believe it's been around for about 50 years now, but this wide-bodied aircraft, a double-decker with the hump on the front, it really did open up the skies to long-haul travel for many people who couldn't travel before. Immediately, there were 350, 400 seats, uh, which was almost tripling the, 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 the seats available. And I think initially most airlines had quite a job to fill them and of course they responded by reducing the fares and so that's when it started to change. It definitely brought the price of travel down and it got the publicity for people to think about it, to stop it being a rich man's preserve and start it being for every man. When I joined the Jumbo, we had 30 aircraft and it was the biggest Jumbo fleet in the world. It is beautiful to fly. I always loved it. It's just something, some people felt that way about Concorde, but for me, I would fly it and I'd do a flight to Bangkok and you'd all get off and you'd look back and you think, I was part of the team that brought that here. It's just lovely. It was just a fantastic aeroplane. Lots of things changed because when I joined BOAC, we had to have navigator's licenses and we had to do our share of sticking a sextant at the top of the aeroplane, shooting stars, drawing lines on maps and guessing where you'd been. When the jumbo came along the great difference was you actually knew where you were. It basically had three what are called inertial platforms which uh, you basically told them where they were on the ground before you set off and thereafter they could measure every movement that you made and to calculate where you were in the world. 
It, it made life a, a lot easier and a lot more precise. It took away some of the, the sort of uh, uh, the skills, I suppose. With each new era in aircraft development, the role of the pilot has also had to evolve. I think that the modern aircraft uh, just bring out a different set of skills. They give you so much more information now. It's just at your fingertips, and all this information is there to, to aid and help the pilot to know exactly where they are and, and how they're flying. Collision avoidance systems, whereby we can see other aircraft in the air, and it gives you guidance. The aircraft talk to each other so that they avoid each other. All those sort of technological advances actually aid the pilot and aid safety as well. Now stepping into the futuristic cockpit of the A350 simulator gives a glimpse into the world of today's pilots. You can bring up all sorts of systems. So in the old days, you'd, you'd get the old manual out in the Comet and you'd look through, oh, we've got a hydraulic problem. Now you can bring it up and live look at what's actually going on with the, with the undercarriage or the electrics or the, or the gear. All that information's there to help you. You've got computers to work through calculations. Again, in the old days, you'd be sitting there with your pencil and, and working out and different calculations, whereas you've got computers to help you do that. If I was a pilot from the 1920s or, or from, from the early era of flying, I think they'd be quite blown away by everything they could see but they would recognize a lot of things they'd recognize that you know these are thrust levers you know and that's just the same as, as, as an old aircraft way back that they they would push forward as well they'd recognize that they've got an undercarriage which is the same um, and they have flaps that, that are the same um, so lots of it you know the computerized bits would be different but the actual instrumentation they, they would get to recognize that fairly quickly and, and it would definitely they would sit here and think yeah this is an aircraft you know. These early pilots were mostly former military men, with the battlefield their training grounds. However, by the 1950s, with their numbers diminishing, BOAC and BEA recognized the need to create their own air college to train new recruits. It started here, the College of Air Training, at a place called Hamble on the south coast of England. Getting in wasn't easy. Of all those who apply, only about one in 10 is lucky enough to come here for 18 months training. Former BOAC pilot Eric Moody was one of the lucky ones chosen to attend Hamble. They set off uh, BOAC and BEA to make that the Cranwell of civil aviation. And it was modeled on that totally. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a very good level of uh, standard of training down there. And we were trained as civilian airline pilots, not as uh, train killers. One of the first things you do are these tests to find out what sort of person you are and how you behave under pressure. Everything's measured and evaluated. How quick are your reactions? How well can you concentrate? How consistent are you? They need to know all this and a lot more before they finally decide whether you're the sort of person that's likely to make a pilot. And I was there for two years and we flew chipmunks and Apaches, uh, Piper Apaches. And these airplanes had basic flying instruments, so it really was old-fashioned flying. When your instructor gets out of the rear cockpit and tells you to stay where you are, you know what's coming. You're going to be allowed to take it up and fly it by yourself. Today, the great outdoors is swapped for BA's simulator hall, where much of their pilot's training takes place. The modern simulators are incredibly lifelike, so you can, you can learn on here and then go straight out and fly with customers on the aircraft, obviously with a training captain with you to start with, but that's how good the simulators are. 50, 40, 30, 20, retard. So we've got 16 in here, so we've got all of our um, different uh, aircraft types represented. So everything from the, the 787 all the way through to the, the brand new 350. And when you look inside them, they're actually, they are identical to the aircraft. It's incredible. And you, you get in there, you fly them around and you come out and you feel like you've been, you know, you've been in New York or whatever. You, you step back out and there's this weird feeling that you've, oh, come, so I'm in, the, I'm in the training building. These simulators are unrecognizable in comparison to the very earliest versions. British Airways opened a school for the training of its flying personnel. A remarkable device known as the Link Trainer is in use for blind flying instruction. The simulators before that, literally just a, a box on legs to start with, and then all the way to these modern sims that are multi-million pound pieces of device. I mean, they're just incredible. You look at them, they are state-of-the-art. Um, it's kind of space age. 
New recruits have to undertake 50 hours of simulator training and dozens of hours of real flight time before they can join the ranks of British Airways 3,900 pilots. And we still take on ex-military pilots, um, but we take on pilots from other airlines, but also we, we get cadets and we get pilots that come through training straight into to BA. So we get a huge diverse group of pilots flying air aircraft because we know um, that's what, what we need. One person who has helped pave the way for such diversity is Lynn Barton, who became the first British Airways female captain in 1996. We used in those days come out of the flight deck to say goodbye to passengers as they were getting off. And I was saying goodbye, and uh, this large gentleman made some a little bit disparaging remark about having had a female pilot drive him to the destination. And behind him was his uh, much shorter, fearsome wife, who gave him an ear bashing all the way off the aircraft. They put up with a few remarks, funny remarks, and it doesn't go beyond that really, mm. so it's not too bad. What kind of remarks? Oh, well, the sort of thing, it's all very nice, but really women should be staying in the kitchen and not, you know, not trying to interfere sort of thing. It was a completely different time, but of course, being brought up in that time, I didn't really perceive it as a handicap. Once I was qualified, being a girl has been a bonus. Now, BA employs more female pilots than any other UK airline, as the company continues to try and attract more women into the industry. Coming up, Concord takes to the skies. You almost become an astronaut. And new technology promises to transform the airport experience. We recognise that uh, using something like biometrics will help change this dramatically. Since the first flight by British Airways predecessor, AT&T, in 1919, the airline has grabbed many a headline. But perhaps its biggest splash was in 1976 with the introduction of the iconic supersonic Concorde, an aircraft which soon had the most sought after seats in the sky. This is indeed Concorde's day. This isn't first class, this is Concorde class. You had the best food, you had caviar, lobster, the best prawns. I mean, it doesn't compare with buying a sandwich on board on a, a low cost airline today, that's for sure. I think once you'd flown on Concorde, it was like being a member of an exclusive club. We took the most travel sophisticated people in the world on Concorde, and there was always a little spark in their eye. Concorde flew five miles above and 800 miles per hour faster than the subsonic 747s, and their development had been a joint venture between the British and the French. 16 of the world's airlines on the threshold of the supersonic age. Customers for the Anglo-French Concorde, the first supersonic airliner in the world. Well, Concorde was a project born in the 1960s out of a really uh, grand uh, political desire to have a, a major cooperation between the UK and France, something which uh, in these days of post-Brexit you could hardly imagine. They were really there like, to show how advanced British and also French science, technology and engineering had become. British Airways and Air France were the only companies to purchase Concorde, and London to New York became BA's key route, more than halving the journey time for passengers to just three and a half hours. There was always that moment of excitement that you see two dawns going to New York. I mean, how can you get bored with that? You know, that actually we were so high that you could actually begin to see the curve of the Earth. You're literally on the edge of space. I mean, you're 55,000 feet. I mean, Concorde was tested up to 65,000 feet. And apparently, when you get up to that sort of level where the sky goes really dark, NASA actually calls you, you almost become an astronaut. Quite extraordinary, really, isn't it? <laughs> you would not be serving the main course as it just came up to before Mach 1. And then there would be that little just, it's just like a hiccup. Hoop. There we are. Mac 1, we are now at the speed of sound. And then you were over the sound barrier, and then going up to twice the speed of sound. BA's Concords flew for 27 years before the final passenger flight on October the 24th, 2003. What really put an end to its uh, operation was uh, the aftermath of the 9-11 terror attacks, because Concorde really relied on the New York route on quite a small number of regular travellers, and a large number of these people were actually killed in the Twin Towers attack. So unfortunately they decided that they would retire the aircraft. But of course when they made the announcement, everybody wanted to fly in it. 
So they had 18 months of before the last flights went and every flight was full. You couldn't get a ticket on it. When it came to the very last flight, it was a big crowd of people there. It was a lot of British and a lot of French. There was thousands of people that turned out at Heathrow to see it, you know, the, the final three uh, aircraft come in to land. The cabin crew were crying when they came off, you know, and it was just very emotional. But the Concorde name and its luxury still live on today. Welcome to the Concorde Lounge, uh, British Airways premium lounge here at JFK's Terminal 7. The Concorde room originally was put in place for our customers flying the Concorde, linking New York and London. What we have done to retain that exclusivity in our two premium markets that is to create this haven within the airport environment that feels really like you're in a luxurious hotel. We have gourmet fine dining. Um, we have vintage champagnes, premium spirits for those of us that like those things. And um, for those of us that don't, then we have everything that anybody will want here. And the Concorde room staff really do go the extra mile for their first class customers. I have an example of somebody who'd forgotten their business shirt and we were able to have their chauffeur bring that. Um, one of our team members ran out, got the shirt, brought it in, got it pressed, and then the customer's ready to go. In the 50s and 60s, dubbed the golden age of flying, air hostesses were trained in good customer service. And it was a role that became highly coveted. Thousands of girls in Britain want to be air hostesses. It's one of the world's top glamour jobs. It was exciting. It was glamorous. It was a wonderful way to see the world. Girls doing our deportment classes were going to cover all aspects of good grooming and visual poise. Remember that whilst in uniform, stewardesses should be very feminine. Well, it sounds superficial, and it probably was, but I think they were looking for people who looked good and, and uh, who were graceful and who could move well and um, who would be pleasing on the eye. If you select the right young lady, use the most effective methods of training and show her by good example you have the makings of a charming and efficient BEA personality. Ah, looks all right to me. Our job was to look after passengers. Passengers would get on board and we'd have our white gloves on and stand at the door. We didn't stop smiling. We were very welcoming and we just did everything we could to, to, to look after people, really. This warm welcome from the cabin crew was extended right through to the airport experience. To many, the moment of check-in is the first personal contact with the flight. Today, British Airways are introducing new biometric technology within airports, which could change the whole experience for travellers. We recognise that currently the passenger has to get their passport out again and again and again as they go through the airport. Using something like biometrics will help change this dramatically. Biometrics are unique traits uh, that are specific to you as an individual. It's the shape of your face, your fingerprints, your iris, and they're all biometrics. In the new world, what we, we're finding is that uh, we can use the face as the token. So it's the equivalent to the boarding pass now. Your face becomes your permission to move through the airport. BA have successfully trialled biometrics for the boarding of planes in the US. But in order to do this, the process starts when visitors first arrive in the country. Everyone who enters must have their photo taken at immigration. These are then held on a database alongside the individual's passport information, ready for when they come to depart. After your two weeks holiday, you arrive at the airport wanting to go home. Um, and because you've already entered your passport information into the airline systems, Customs and Border Protection can gather that information together and say, we're expecting these 300 people, and here are all the faces that correspond to those individuals. This means that when you actually approach the boarding gates to board the flight home, a photograph can be taken and be compared to that, what we call a gallery of photographs. If they find that, they're assured of identity. We can board this person, open a set of doors, let the customer walk through, close the doors, mark them as boarded, job done. More than halving boarding time for an A380 from 45 minutes to 22 minutes, Biometrics has proved a huge hit, meaning this new technology has secured its place in BA's future. And from robots assisting customers at Heathrow's Terminal 5 to the lightweight modern aircraft, the airline has advanced beyond recognition from its humble beginnings in a small field at Hounslow Heath over a hundred years ago.